In the winter of 1879 to 1880, a band of hostile Apache Indians coming from some point in this unknown region across the plains were making frequent raids upon the stock ranches scattered along the east edge of the plains in Texas, stealing and carrying away many horses. And my principal mission out in that country at that time was to break up these raids and follow and discover, if possible, the hiding place of these Indians. Well, about noon on the 28th of December, 1879, two cowboys came into my headquarters and reported that the Indians had raided the Slaughter Ranch, about 20 miles south of our headquarters, on the previous night, and they had stolen and driven off a large number of horses. Well, within about two hours after receiving this information, 12 of my men under my command, with 10 days rations and other equipment loaded on pack mules, were in our saddles and hurrying to the Slaughter Ranch to take up the trail of these Indians. We reached the Slaughter Ranch and picked up the trail that evening at about five o'clock. The trail led south of the ranch, passing the mouth of the Yellow House Canyon where it climbed the rim rock onto the plains proper and turned due west. Night came on and we struck camp. It began misting rain and then it began to freeze and by the next morning, everything was covered with a shield of ice. We again took up the trail, following it west by Tohoka Lake, then to Double Lakes, a distance of about 60 miles, where night again overtook us and we camped. The following morning, I discovered that the trail led off directly west from Double Lakes and into a country that was, at that time, unknown to white men. The records of the War Department at Washington City will show that back in the summer of 1876, Captain Nolan of the 10th U.S. Cavalry followed a band of these Indians from some point east of the Staked Plains over the same route, passing Tohoka and Double Lakes, and thence into this unknown desert region. It was either in July or August. For two whole days, they followed the trail west of Double Lakes which led into what Captain Nolan described as a perfect desert country with no vegetation and no indication of water. The supply of water carried by the men in their canteens was soon exhausted and they became almost crazed with thirst. And on the evening of the second day out from Double Lakes, at a distance of about 90 miles from said lakes, they refused to follow the officer any further. When Captain Nolan found that he could no further control these men, he decided to turn back on his trail and try to reach Double Lakes. He had with him an extra saddle horse. His own canteen was empty and he himself was suffering greatly from thirst. He had the extra horse killed by cutting its throat and the captain quenched his thirst by drinking the horse's blood. The soldiers cut the horse open and Opening its entrails, they sucked the moisture therefrom to quench their thirst. Captain Nolan then advised them to turn back with him and try to reach Double Lakes. A few of them did so, but the balance of the men refused to return with Captain Nolan to Double Lakes, but instead scattered over the desert in every direction in search of water, and not one of them ever returned alive. Captain Nolan's expedition, a full report of which was made at the time, is on file with the War Department at Washington, D.C., and resulted in an order being issued by the War Department forbidding any Army officer from leading troops into this desert region under penalty of dismissal from the Army and forfeiture of all pay. This was the last expedition of any kind whatever that had ever attempted to enter this unknown country up to the time that I went in there. I knew the history of this ill-fated expedition, and I proposed a profit thereby. Therefore, instead of following the Indian Trail as it led west from Double Lakes and into the desert, as Captain Nolan had done, I sent one of my men, John D. Birdwell, back to my headquarters for a wagon and additional supplies and some empty water kegs, and waited at Double Lakes until his return. When Birdwell returned, instead of following the trail, I turned northwest and after two days march reached what is known as the Yellow Houses, a point on the old trail running west from the headwaters of the Brazos across the plains to Old Fort Summers on the Pecos River in New Mexico. This point, the Yellow Houses, 
was about 90 miles west from my headquarters in Blanco Canyon. It consisted of a considerable depression or basin in the plain extending from north to south for several miles, in the bottom of which were two large salt or alkali lakes. On the west side of these lakes, perhaps a half a mile distant, there's a bluff which rises about 150 feet almost perpendicular and extending along from north to south for a distance of two or three miles. This bluff is a yellowish limestone formation. There are several caves in the face of it. From these caves, the place takes its name. At the foot of this bluff, and near where old Fort Sumner Trail passes, there was a small fresh water spring. Just north of the yellow houses and about three miles distant, in the winter of 1879 to 1880, the Causey brothers, George and John, buffalo hunters, had established their winter camp. I visited this camp and procured from these hunters two fresh buffalo hides. These I fashioned into a kind of saddle bags and, and fitted them onto a couple of pack saddles. In each end of these bags I fitted a 20 gallon water keg. We then filled the four kegs with water from the spring, strapped them on the pack mules, and leaving the wagon and everything else that I could not take along at the yellow houses, and sending Private James L. McElroy back to headquarters with dispatches from this point, we broke camp and followed the old trail west about 10 miles to Silver Lake where we camped for the night. The nights were bitter cold and the springs at Silver Lake froze over that night and the next morning we had to break the ice so that our horses could drink, which they refused to do. My plan was to make a two days march from Silver Lake in a due southwest course into the desert, hoping that within that time to intersect the Indian trail we had left at Double Lakes and possibly find the Lost Lakes, which tradition said were out there somewhere in the desert. I believed that by steady marching for 12 hours a day, I could, within two days, make from 80 to 100 miles, and if I failed to find water within that time, I intended to refill the canteens from the four kegs of water we had with us, give the remainder to the horses, and retrace my steps. Well, at sunrise, we fell in line, and taking our course by a small pocket compass, we started at a brisk walk into the unknown region. For the first few miles, the formation of the Earth's surface was a dark sand with a heavy turf of grass. Then the formation changed to a reddish, loose sand and vegetation became more scattered. This lasted for perhaps 15 miles. At the end of about 30 miles march, we came suddenly in sight of the real desert. This consisted of a range of low sand hills extending north, south, and west as far as the eye, aided by powerful field glasses, could discern, absolutely barren of vegetation, almost white as snow, and certainly by far the most desolate and uninviting region that I've ever beheld. We knew the reputation of this desolate region for bewildering the brain, choking the throat, parching the lips, and swelling the tongue of man and beast even unto death but we did not swerve from our course. We approached it, plunged into it, and traveled on and on. Our progress was slackened somewhat as our horses now at every step sank almost halfway to their knees in the loose white sands. Night came on with not the slightest change in the face of the surrounding country, and we camped in one of the wildest and most desolate spots imaginable. Our horses were even now, at the end of the first day's march, very thirsty. On the following morning, as soon as it was light enough to see the needle on the face of the compass, we were again on the march. The sun came up, and as it climbed higher and higher into the heavens and cast its glittering rays down upon the white sands of the desert, we were entertained continually with that strange phenomena of desert nature's wonderful picture show, the Desert Mirage. Miles away appeared a lake of water on whose margin stood beautiful groves of trees, so natural that one could scarcely believe that they were not real. But the picture would last only for a moment when the scene would change and finally disappear, and another picture equally as interesting and entertaining would appear in some other direction. While looking at these strange phantoms, it was easy to understand why one half crazed with heat and thirst, as were those dusky troopers of the 10th US Cavalry, might run with all remaining strength to reach these imaginary lakes only to find nothing there, and finally to fall exhausted and perish amid the desolation.
All day long, we held steady to our course, never varying, with only the billowy white sand extending in apparent unlimited distance in every direction, the whole pervaded by an awful stillness, a silence that you could almost hear. The stillness seemed to affect the men, and not a dozen words were exchanged among them during the whole day. About five o'clock in the evening, the appearance of the country suddenly changed. We rode out from the sand hills into a more level country, and the earth beneath our horses' feet became more firm with some vegetation. At this point, we crossed what we pronounced a cavalry trail, two narrow trails running parallel with each other, about 20 feet apart and in a due west course. We turned and followed these trails for a short distance, possibly half a mile. They never changed their course nor distance apart. This was undoubtedly the trail made by Captain Nolan and his colored troopers of the 10th Cavalry two or three years before. But as it led us off our course, I could not follow it and turned back on my original course. As we did so, looking ahead of us directly in our line of march, across an almost perfectly level stretch of country and at a distance of three or more miles, we saw a low hill raising probably 30 or 40 feet above the surrounding country with smooth surface, about a half a mile in length and extending from north to south. We approached this hill and just as the sun was sinking beneath the western horizon, we rode to the top of it and looking down to the western end of the base, to our great surprise and joy, we beheld not a mirage, but a real lake of water. We halted for a few moments while I scanned the lake and its surroundings with my field glasses. The hill seemed to slant down to the edge of the lake, and on the west side, opposite from where we stood, there appeared quite a valley, but no living creature could be seen. I felt sure that if there was fresh water about this lake, it would be found on the west side, as is the case with all lakes on the plains. We moved forward, passing around the north end of the lake to the west side, where we found several cold springs of fresh water. It was almost night but still light enough remained for us to discover that a large band of horses had been recently driven in and watered at these springs. Several fires had been kindled and recently burning, four or five horses had been killed, and every particle of flesh cut from their frames. Much fresh Indian sign was here in evidence. On the bank, near the largest spring, standing propped up in a conspicuous position, was an Indian signboard. This consisted of a huge shoulder blade bone of a buffalo. This bone, which was the largest of the kind I ever saw, had lain out in the desert sun until it was bleached as white as snow. As is well known, this bone is fan-shaped, and this one was about 14 to 16 inches long, about 10 inches wide at one end, tapering to about 2 inches in diameter at the other end. One side was perfectly smooth and ideal for the purpose for which it had been used a means of communication from one band of Indians to another by pictures painted thereon in green, yellow, and red. Holding this signboard before you with the wide end uppermost, there appeared neatly executed the following. Beginning on the right side, near the edge, there were two lines of large shod horses tracks, running parallel and in the direction of the opposite side of the board. In front of these tracks was an Indian leading a pony with teepee poles lashed to his sides and dragging on the ground behind him. Resting on these poles was a lot of baggage. In front of the Indian and near the left-hand edge of the board were some Indian teepees, some trees, and an Indian standing near a fire, apparently cooking. We interpreted this to mean that the Indians knew we were following them and had moved their camp further west to some point where it was safe where there were trees and had sought to communicate these facts to any of their friends who might come in after them. We camped at this lake that night, christened it Ranger Lake, and remained there the following day. During that day, I rode around in the vicinity of the lake and noted that several bands of horses had been recently driven in here from the east. I also discovered a large trail leading off from the lake in a southwest direction over which many horses had been driven. I also noted the marks of teepee poles along this trail. On the following morning, we broke camp, picked up this trail, and followed it for a distance of 18 or 20 miles. About noon, it led up onto a slight elevation, and looking down the west side, we saw a chain of four small lakes running along the base of the hill and 
extending about northwest and southeast. Each of these lakes were about one-fourth of a mile in length and separated one from the other by a narrow neck of land. On the west side of the lakes, there appeared a considerable valley extending about a fourth of a mile out from the lakes where there was a bluff or abrupt rise in the ground. The trail led us between the two south lakes and around to the west side where we found several springs of fresh water. Here we found much Indian sign, consisting of campfires where the ashes were still warm and the skeletons of several horses that had been recently killed and all their flesh taken. From this point, the trail, which was fresh, led on in a southeast course. Now we were in hostile Indian country with at least 250 miles of desert and plains country between us and our headquarters. Our supplies were running low and our horses were weak. Besides, I knew from the course and rate we had traveled coming in that we were far beyond the boundary line of Texas, which line was the limit of our jurisdiction. Hence, I decided not to follow the trail any further. We halted here and remained the balance of the day. The following morning, I turned back on my trail and reached Ranger Lake. I knew that the habit of these Indians was to make their raids on the settlers and do their stealing during the moonlight nights, and as this lake appeared to be the first watering place after crossing the desert, I believed there was a chance for a band of these Indians to be still back east of the plains and possibly on their way out. So I decided to stop here until after the full of the moon with the hope of intercepting them as they came out. Accordingly, I went into a low range of sand hills on the east side of this lake and concealed my men and horses there as best I could reduced my remaining rations to less than one half ration per day per man, and put out the pickets south and north on the high ground, each with a strong field glass, and with instructions to keep a close lookout in every direction, and especially toward the east for the approach of any band of Indians. We stayed here under these conditions for 15 days. The days were clear and warm, but the nights were bitter cold. Our rations consisted of bacon, flour, and coffee without sugar. Soon the supply of bacon was exhausted. There was almost nothing for our horses to eat, so that our stay here was simply gradual starvation for both men and horses. That is true, there was plenty of game there, but under the circumstances, we did not dare use our ammunition shooting game. After we had lain here several days and our rations were almost entirely exhausted, I sent three of my men Joe Rush, F. S. Bell, and J. B. Gibson back to the Four Lakes to kill some antelope. They returned the following day and reported that they had seen a band of 20 Indians at the Four Lakes and that the Indians had attempted to take the men's horses, and from the signs around the Four Lakes there was a body of Indians somewhere very near there. We did not go back to the Four Lakes in search of those Indians on account of the smallness of our number. The weakened condition of our horses, and the great distance we were from our headquarters with no hope of reinforcements or relief from any quarter. We remained where we were until about the 21st of January, 1880. By this time, our rations were completely exhausted. We broke camp and started back to our headquarters. The first day of our homeward journey was clear and bright and we had no difficulty in following our trail. On that day, one of the men killed an antelope and we ate every particle of it for supper with neither bread nor salt. The next morning, about five o'clock, it began to snow, and by daylight, the ground was covered. The snow was coming from the northeast. There was a stiff breeze, and it would be hard to imagine a more forlorn aspect than the little squad of men presented that morning as they fell in line and took up the march, facing that terrible blizzard, already half famished with not a morsel of food, the horses, almost exhausted, reeled as they walked. The men were gaunt and haggard from starvation, their faces drawn and pinched until their most intimate friends would not have recognized them. I knew that 50 or 60 miles northeast there was the Yellow House and the Causey Brothers Buffalo Camp and that there was relief if we could but reach those points. But I also knew that if we should miss those points, there was but little chance for us in that terrible storm. I took my pocket compass and getting my course as best I could, we struck out facing the storm. The men and pack mules followed me all day long until about 12 o'clock that night. 
In fact, for 18 hours we faced that awful snowstorm with the mercury at about 10 below zero. Now those who know anything about a blizzard on the plains of Texas may have some idea of our situation. Night came on and there was no relief in sight. The snow by this time was 12 or 14 inches deep. About 10 o'clock that night, one of my men, John D. Birdwell, called me and said that he could go no further, that his horse had given out. His hands and feet were paralyzed with cold. I halted and had the men to catch an old Indian pony that we had picked up at Ranger Lake and put Birdwell on him and tied him on with a rope. We again moved forward. Some of the others were complaining dreadfully with cold. We were simply covered from head to feet with a shield of ice. About 10 minutes after we had changed Birdwell onto the Indian pony, it quit snowing. The clouds seemed to rise up and a star appeared directly in front of us. We were almost as glad to see the star that night as we were the lake of water we discovered back in the desert. I now knew I would follow a straight course. I took the star as my guide and after about half an hour's march we came suddenly to the brink of a high bluff. By this time the clouds had broken up and the stars were shining. We bore north in our course and soon found a place where we could descend. On reaching the foot of the cliff we discovered that we were near the yellow houses, the place where we had left our wagon on our way out and where there was at least some shelter for the men and horses. We found everything just as we had left it. About a hundred feet up the cliff from the wagon, there was a cave capable of sheltering our whole squad. When we were here before, we had gathered some mesquite roots for fuel, but had not burned them all. We had left some of these roots piled up near the wagon. Although they were covered with snow, the men went that night and found them and brought them up into the cave and built a fire. They then cut Birdwell's gloves and boots off and carried him up into the cave and laid him down near the fire. He was suffering so with cold, he rolled over and passed his hands through the blaze of the fire. But this caused him such great pain that he fainted. He became unconscious and was dragged out into the snow by the men and his hands, face, and feet were rubbed with snow. He regained consciousness and was taken back into the cave only to do the same thing over. He was again dragged out and brought back to consciousness in the same manner. When he was brought back into the cave and blankets piled onto him and a guard put over him so to keep him away from the fire. We made ourselves as comfortable as we could in this cave for the remainder of the night. Next morning the sun rose bright and clear, not a cloud was seen. I sent two of my men with pack mules over to the Causey Brothers Buffalo Camp and procured several hundred pounds of fine buffalo meat, flour, sugar, and other supplies. When they returned, I issued these rations to the men sparingly, allowing each one of them to a small amount at first. The men were so weak from hunger and exposure to cold that they could scarcely stand up, and some of them, when attempting to walk, would turn blind and stagger like drunk men. We were still several days' journey from our headquarters, and the intervening plain was covered with 12 or 14 inches of snow. We rested at the yellow houses for a couple of days, and then we continued our march toward our headquarters, which we reached within about three days after an absence of 40 days. We had been given up lost. On this trip, we had traveled between five and 600 miles in the dead of winter on less than half rations for ourselves and almost nothing for our horses. In my opinion, few men have suffered more and lived than did this little squad of rangers during the campaign above described. Certainly no men are more deserving of honor and reward. Most of them have already crossed the Great Divide. Those that are still living are old and gray. Their services in this campaign were invaluable to the state of Texas in that they penetrated a region of country that was at that time absolutely unknown to white men and discovered lakes of water in the heart of the Great Desert. They also discovered the hiding place of this band of hostile Indians which had been raiding the frontier of Texas from time immemorable and broke up their rendezvous, forcing them to move further west, and they were never known to make another raid on that part of the frontier of Texas again. Captain G. W. Arrington, Frontier Battalion. Hey.